Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Jake's Take with Jacob L.A. Sharp podcast. I'm your host, Jacob L.A. Sharp, the chief content producer and writer of jakestake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. It is a great day today because I have a fabulous guest with me. He is a singer, a songwriter, a trumpeter, a band leader of the band Louis Prima Jr. and the Witnesses. He has a great social media following with 2,500 Instagram followers as of recording, 6,500 Twitter followers, and 27,000 Facebook followers. Please help me welcome Louis Prima Jr. Good morning. How are you, Jacob? I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm doing good. Just waking up, getting ready for the world. (laughs) Absolutely. So let's get this conversation started. So in your humble opinion, how has the music industry evolved since you first started out? Has it changed for the better, for the worse, and why? Um, I you know I'm I'm reluctant to say for the worst because it is the entertainment business and there's always good and bad about it. But as far as uh, the music business as a whole, since the '80s when I was doing rock and roll, it's changed um, tenfold. I mean, you used to you know the the basics of it was you toured to sell your record. Um, and now you record and sell records so you can tour like the, uh, uh, the income streams have changed. Entertainment as we know, it has changed, um, as far as, you know, the live performance, it's not so much about bands anymore. It's uh, everything's pre-recorded and they want the big dance numbers and light shows. And, uh, I, I don't know if that's what, you know the record industry is targeting or the media is targeting, but it, it's, it's changed quite a bit, you know, and the, and the biggest thing is the, the business model of it. Um, you know, as, as far as touring, you know, on the level that we do, I think it's actually gotten better um, coming out of the pandemic here because I think people are more anxious to go see a live show. Um, but like I said, it's, it's a little backwards. you, um, you know, you have to change up a lot of what you do to be financially viable. And that's, that's the biggest change. I gotta say, I, I rather see, I love as much as I love seeing performers and everything. I love at some of the most memorable concerts I've been to have been with just musicians playing no <clears throat> cheap tricks, no, no st- spectaculars. I, it's been great music. I've seen Fleetwood Mac three times. I've seen Bon Jovi several times. It's I rather see bands that can deliver and use music musically. Well, it's I'm like that, too. I mean, uh, you know, I I grew up in with probably one of the most entertaining live acts as my parents um, as far as entertainment. And I think what's happened over the years is that the entertainment value of the band has gone away. Uh, I think musicians. um forgot how to entertain up on stage and it became about standing behind a microphone and playing a chord and ooh look at me instead of look at the crowd and you're there for the crowd i think that's why a lot of acts today have the dance numbers and and the light shows because people you know if you're going out and you're spending your money and want to see a show you just don't want to hear music you have to see it as well and you know it's it's cheaper and easier for a producer to hit play on the MacBook and, you know, record at the cheapest humanly possible and Mm -hmm. let the, you know, then you got to go out and hire the dancers and, you know, no, no disrespect to the people that are out there doing it, but not my cup of tea. And I, a little part of me doesn't understand why the world is so into that. (laughs) I don't know why either, but you did mention that you come from a musical family, your father, was the legendary tuner Louis Prima, who was personally invited by Frank Sinatra to perform at the President Kennedy's inauguration. And he was also the voice, he also voiced the scene stealing King Louis in Disney's The Jungle Book. So what were some of the lessons that you learned from him and your mom that helped you grow as a performer? I the biggest thing, you know, I learned from my father is I think humility. Um he took great joy in dragging me everywhere when I was little, Uh, you know, anytime he was in town when we were either living in New Orleans or Vegas, anytime he went out, he drug me with him. And I got to see how he treated people on a daily basis, not just surrounding the show. And he was never too busy to stop 
and talk to anybody that wanted to come up and say hi. Um, you know, just <laughs> and anybody, you know, fans, uh, employees of shops, celebrities that we'd come across. It was, um, you know, he he treated people as if they were his friends, uh, including after the show, you know. And I think it's one of the things that people like about us when we tour is that immediately after the show, uh, myself and then I'm joined by the whole band, you know, mingle with the crowd to say hi and take pictures and share stories. I, I think that's part of um, keeping in tune with the with the audience and understanding that it's it should be a familial thing between the artist and the and the crowd. So I, you know, I learned a lot from that, and the rest is just seeing what he did and what my mom did on stage. You learn. Um, not not by forcing yourself to learn, but just by seeing and being around it. That's what entertainment is. I love hearing that. I love the hearing hearing the story of the American crowd because there's a lot of people. I've noticed a lot of artists that I've watched over the years and I've interacted with. They do after the show, they do meet with people. They do talk with that. And I and you have that connection with that. And I and I really enjoy those types of artists who do that. Like I understand, like when they're when they're like like superstar level, that's a pro, that could be is that could be a complex situation. But like that's what I love about people. It you know, it, when it gets to a superstar level, you know, I've I've got friends at that level, and it it's you know it's a little cumbersome when you can't walk out the house. Um, and you, you know, there, there has to be a respect level where you give people space, but I also don't believe in the artist charging, you know, that there's, there's people out there that do the meet and greet for $2,000. You can come back to stage to see Miley Cyrus. And it's like, I, uh, you know, at, at some point, um, I think, I think that's robbing the fan. It's, it's, uh. I don't even know how to explain it. There's a there's a way to do it. You know, when you go see Aerosmith backstage before a show, you know, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry are sitting in a room with a line of 50 people who have won tickets on a radio station or won the chance to see them, meet them backstage. You know, and there's no there's no money exchanged. It's just a, it's a bond between artist and fan. And I I've never understood the unwillingness to do that i think you have to do it even at the top level and those that aren't are um, cheating cheating the crowd so to speak i have to agree with you on that one so what have been some of the challenges that you faced throughout your career and how have you overcome those obstacles <clears throat> oh biggest challenge is the business itself you know it's uh i did you know rock and roll for 10 years in the 80s and 90s and the business end of it drove me from the business um you know there, there there's a learning curve and a learning process and the business is not a fun business to be in and you've got to be smart and you have to learn things and and, and be well read on laws and and things in order to navigate the contractual world of the music business um but once you, you know, finding the right team and people around you, management and agent and agents that believe in you and na help navigate that with you uh, is the biggest help. You know, the other challenge is the little JR at the end of my name. You know, there's uh, it's people would probably view it as a positive that doors are flying open for me as I roam around. And it's just not the case. You know, I have the largest shoes in entertainment to fill. And if I had a dollar for everybody that said, well, he's not his father, um, I'd be rich. Uh, it's, I'm not trying to be my father. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a lucky person who has made it as a offspring of a famous person and there's few and far between that have managed to stay true to themselves in their careers and been successful uh, especially when you share the name you know it's uh when people come to see me i think there's a good percentage that want to see my father and no matter what i do on stage we can be the most entertaining band in the world which i think we are 
Um, you know, we could, we can be 100% perfect and that person's just not going to be happy because it's not what they thought they were getting. Uh, so that's, the, that's the biggest detriment is overcoming and creating and, and trying to be new and fresh and bring this music to younger audiences and different audiences and people that may or may not even want to walk in the door, but took a shot and winning them over as fans. Um, you know, trying to compete with that percentage that want to see my father that don't really even know what he was about. Probably have never, you know, never saw him live other than videos. You know, the other day I had a comment on social media uh, that, you know, I also have to delete things every day because people are a little bit cruel. But it, it, this guy went on and on about how I don't have my father's voice. I'm not as low and I, I don't have the low voice and i sing too high and and blah 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 blah. and i i you know i don't respond but i wanted to respond and go you know my father sang in a higher key than me it's <laughs> um it, it's up to the perception and winning those people over is the big challenge and i think for the most part the band and i do a great job of winning people onto our side and and you move on you can't please everybody you know Absolutely. And here's the thing. It's very interesting to have like those last names. And I constantly think about the people like Michael Jackson's kids and then with, with being Ricardo's on like how Lucy Arnaz and Ricky and, and Desi Arnaz Jr. have thought of having those last names. It's, you know, I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of uh, offsprings, you know, um, and, and you pass them along the way, everybody from uh, Tito Fuentes' children and, and you know, Dean Martin and et cetera, uh, Frank Sinatra Jr., of course. And it's, um, I don't know, it's it's difficult to cross the board. And, and it's, you have to view it as a, as a good thing and as as a challenge. You know, I've never... I have never, you know, when you tell people I did rock and roll for 10 years, the first question is, why didn't you just start doing your father's music? And did you, were you rebelling against it? And and the answer is absolutely not. I love my father's music. You know, when I was a kid, I loved it. I think it's the most brilliant and challenging music to play and perform. And I've always loved it. I, it, but I'm a, you know, I'm a rock and roll fan and you got to do, do what your friends are doing, you know? So I've always embraced the music. I, I I love that Louis Primo was my father. I like talking about him. I like championing him. I like maintaining the brand, so to speak. Um, and it's it's a joy to do it. And I think there are a vast majority of children of famous people that don't really embrace it. And I think that's to their detriment. Um, you have to you have to embrace brace it and love it and treat it like it's your own. Uh, and just, like I said, you, you rise above the critics. I'm not trying to fill his shoes. I'm not trying to be him. Um, you know, I, I do look like him a bit. I do move like him every once in a while. I do sound like him every once in a while. Uh, that's not purposeful. Uh, and we're trying to do our own, you know, do you, you got to do your own thing. You got to be your own person and still, pay the tribute and and give the respect to a genius you know and he was a genius absolutely and what i love about your sound and i love about the witnesses is you guys are your own sound you guys are your own band and i would love to learn the origin story of the witnesses (laughs) well you know when i started uh, i've actually started putting this band together several times i mean even back to 1995 but uh uh, in 2004, it was a chance encounter with an um, old uh, club owner and manager from the rock and roll days at the same time as a chance encounter with uh, Mike Varney from Shrapnel Records. And that kind of got me back into, you know, let's put a band together for real. You know, I was I was going and sitting in and, you know, getting on stage every once in a while just to have fun. But it, it was you know, that I think I've always wanted to be on stage. So just looking for the right opportunity and the opportunities came up, but then you go, where am I going to get a band? So it's, you know, there was several years starting in 2004 
uh, several years of just going through the chart readers and the pro guys, you know, really test super talented people that have absolutely no interest in being a band. They want to show up. They want to read that chart. They want to get their paycheck and go home. Uh, nothing against them. Not what I wanted. So you slowly start looking for people, you know, as you're getting out there, as I'm getting out there and touring, I'm always looking for people. And I ran into uh, one of my best friends from rock and roll at a bar in an airport of all places. And we, uh, <clears throat> bass player, a dear friend of mine, uh, rest in peace. He passed away a couple of years ago, but we, um, I was like, dude, you can play this music. Come be in the band. Let's come see what it's about and tell me what you think. And uh, he jumped on board and, you know, I used him to let's go find the musicians. Who's out there? Who have you played with? You know, he's been a touring musician his whole life. Let's go find people. Uh, and he bought in the rhythm section, uh, the uh, drummer and um, the original guitar player from 2010 that just kind of solidified what I wanted in, in the rhythm section. And I wanted a lack of a better term. I wanted a punk rock rhythm section. You know, my, my father, Jimmy Vincent, my father's drummer hit those drums like nobody. I mean, he, if you get in a room with that guy, you can't hear yourself think he, and he, and he's effortless, you know, he's, he's moving like this, but the sound is huge. And I wanted that, you know, I need aggression in the music because, because my father's music is aggression. Um, so he bought in, actually bought in the keyboard player first. Then we found those two and we were playing in, uh, uh, Los Angeles at a place called Dragonfly. Uh, actually it's going to be t 12 years ago next month. Um, a little guy with a saxophone walked in and after the show said, hi, my name's Marco Paulus. I believe I met you at Sam Butera's funeral, but I'm your sax player can we talk? And I went, okay, let's, let's talk. And can you bring in a couple of the horn players and let's do an audition. And, um, one song in, I knew that that was my horn line. You know, you, I had to find people that will learn a song, play the song to the best that they can and jump around on stage like an idiot, like I do, you know, it's, uh, it's, I found, you know, along the way, and there's been changes along the way I found like-minded people that want to create um that enjoy the creative process as well as you know the live performance people that want the microphone out of my hand you know i want people that want center stage all the time and i have found that and have maintained it now uh 12 years you know um that we've had this incarnation of the band and i i couldn't be happier man the live show you ask people the light. It's it's hard to put it out there in a video. You you kind of can capture a little bit of it, but the live show's a freight train, and uh, the crowds just love it. That is amazing, and I hope to one day that you guys find your way to Kansas City. We we actually have that uh, on the calendars um, at the start of the summer, I believe. We're still working out contracts and dates. We've got seventy four uh dates in the works right now um just up through july and I was really looking forward to getting back on the road the way we used to you know pounding it out we i love being on the road and bringing the music to new people you know we've got the oddest demographic people don't understand what to do with us half the time because you pull up the demographic and it's flat from 18 to 100 i mean it doesn't there's no peaks and valleys we have a, a really diverse crowd and I, th I, I think it's an homage to what the band behind me puts out there every night um because people really do you said it earlier you want to go see a you want to see a great show you want to see people playing and believing in what they do and we do that every night i don't care how tired we are and it's a blessing i'm fortunate and the crowds uh I mean, we get a kick out of the crowd. So it's 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 like a big house party, and I love it. Awesome. I would love to learn some of the stories behind the so some of your top songs. <clears throat> There's it's quite a few. Um, yeah, uh, I actually picked up five. For time's sake, I picked up five of my favorites. All right, you go ahead. You tell me the song, and I'll tell you the story. 
<laughs> I love. I was listening to this morning. I love good on repeat. Goody two shoes. <laughs> we were looking for you know as as you're as you have a game plan and you're trying to get your name out there and let people know what you're doing besides my father's music, you know, as we're writing and creating, it's, uh, you look for, I, I wanted a good cover song, something that was popular, probably that everybody would know, um, may not be their favorite act or whatever, but they, they know, you know, the song, you know, it's, it's, uh, and I'm <laughs> not really a big fan of, uh adamant i i i saw him once live and i thought the live show was great i think he's a phenomenal performer but the only song i really knew was goody two shoes so as i'm looking through songs that i think we can just take and swing the heck out of it that one popped into my head and uh, you know i spread it around the um key songwriters in the band and i was like what do you think about this one and we all kind of loved it and it's it, it's a fun fun song to play live <clears throat> because it and it and it takes on new meaning when you have the full horn section and everybody playing. Uh, but it, it's it's a fun song to do live, and it's fun to see people in the crowd as you're starting the song. They're going, "Why do I know this song? Why do I know this song?" And when we hit into the groove, you see everybody kind of light up, and and you know they're back out there on the dance floor d- dancing like Carlton like they're in the eighties and <laughs> it's, it's just, it, it's a fun, it's a fun song. And, and, uh, look, a good song is a good song and I'll play the heck out of anything. <clears throat> Absolutely. I guys say new Orleans seems like the perfect song for that city. So <clears throat> my drummer, uh, AD Adams actually came up with the line. It's a long way to new Orleans. And it was, you know, we write, we get together in his studio in Phoenix, and it's uh, uh, me and, and A.D. Adams, my guitar player, Ryan McKay, and my sax player, Marco Paulo. So we, we get together for these little jam sessions where you just, everybody kind of brings stuff to the table, and you're playing it around and seeing what's going to stick. And the uh, um, my guitar player had that, you know, the, the chunk and rhythm guitar going, and ad sang that line out and i said okay let me, let me just record this blurb and go back and see what i can do with this and it the, the lyrics came very quick and easy and it's because i do love new orleans i've been away from i had been away from new orleans we moved to vegas in 1978 uh right after my father passed away and i've been there since and um i'm done i was done with vegas and we because of touring and because my uh, my mom had moved to Destin, so there was a lot of opportunity. I would fly here and go visit her and then come back here. Um, and there's just a love for this town and a love for the people and the atmosphere and the, and the, the, the food and the <clears throat> lights and the revelry and the love of music and the, and the friendships that you just, you know, when you when you leave, every time you leave, I'm like, why don't I just turn this plane around? and stay and that's kind of what the song is the song is about you know it it's about every time you leave it's like i'll be back tomorrow for next chance i get i'm going to be back in new orleans you just wait here for me and new orleans does and you step right in and it it's like you were never gone and that you know the 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 song lyrically is that there are a hundred little Easter eggs in that song to friends that, you know, fits in the song perfectly, but only that guy knows what that means, you know? (laughs) And, uh, musically, I, it it does. That song screams New Orleans. I, I, when we kick into the Dixieland, um, after the last chorus, you know, as we we sing the last chorus out of the solo section and everybody's wailing, I'm like, that's, I, that's New Orleans, and uh, you know, sorry, sorry, I had to say New Orleans. It fits into the song. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, I love "Go Let's Go." <clears throat> "Go Let's Go" is the uh, first song that I wrote for the band, and it just it, uh, um, it's uh, actually started writing it in the shower. You you get a 
rhythm in your head and it just kind of sticks. And as a songwriter, you know, when you get that in your head, you just, just stop what you're doing and you got to start jotting things down. And uh, it, you know, it, it was, <clears throat> it, it, I actually did the music first came to me and then it was like, what am I going to write over this? And I wanted it to be um, a little bit like uh, my father's maybe jump drive and whale or, uh, you know, songs like that that are really poppy and horn driven. And I, you know, start you start writing it and um, what, what started off maybe a song about dancing, I think it's more about, uh, you know, revelry and, and meeting somebody and uh, taking them home if you if you listen to it very carefully but it's um i it's i love that song we love to perform it uh i think it's a crowd favorite as well uh but that, that was just born in um having fun speaking of having fun blow the song blow <laughs> <laughs> this this is the best story so we as we went in to do this album our record label warrior records um uh put us into capital records to record and we, I wanted an instrumental. I wanted the saxophone feature for Marco to be on the first out, al- the first solo album, you know, the uh, original album, so to speak. And we, uh, <clears throat> we, he had some bits and pieces, but by the time we got into the studio, it was not complete yet. So it was finished off the writing of it in the studio. And when you're recording the rhythm section, the rhythm section's all set up in Studio B. And Marco is in a little side room, actually a hallway. <laughs> you can see him through a window. That's it. And he's got uh, microphone and headphones on. And we tried to do this song to, you know, uh, you, you use a click track in the studio for a lot of reasons to keep tempos and, and, you know, so you can come back and fix mistakes if you blew one note. And we couldn't make the intro to this song work for a click track. So we decided, okay, no click track for this song. Let's just deal with it. So then how do you count it off? Um, So Marco was going to have to be the one to count it off. So he could, so the band would know where the bumps are after, you know, it's a call and response on the sax and the intro. So he yells out, you know, if everybody's ready, I'm just going to blow. And he started blowing. And when we got the song finished, I, you know, we're, we're had, didn't even have a name for it. And we were, we're getting ready to mix. And that vocal tag was still on the tape, even though it's not tape, but it's still there. And I said, why don't we just call the song blow and use that as the intro? I think that's an Um, excellent It, it and it is and it you know it became the the title track to the album because i felt that we are doing with horns what nobody is doing right now i mean even tower of power has taken gone away from the horn driven tunes that they were and i think our horns are the key to our music and name the album it and name that song it and blow Awesome. One final song I want to talk about with you is That's My Home, but the song you did with your dad, and it's a wonderful song. So we, you know, we we talked a lot about, um, you know, doing something like that. And uh, Jim Urban from Warrior Records uh, had gotten the okay. Finally, it took him a while to get the okay from uh, Capital and Universal Music to use one of the tracks that my father had recorded Uh, you know we wanted to try to do a duet um just to see what it what it would do but you start pulling out songs that are in their catalog their capital that they own the masters to and there's not a lot of songs that were record weren't recorded with just two mics hanging in a room so you couldn't isolate just the vocal. You know, you've got the whole band playing and it's picking up on all the microphones uh, just because of the way my father recorded. So we um, very limited in the songs that 
we had to choose from and this one kind of stuck out to jim and he bought it to me and said i think this is a great song just because of the theme of the album the theme of what you're doing and where you're going in life and things and it's uh it, it is a song about new orleans that's my home and it's one of the only songs where you could isolate my father's voice and just pull it out um so we the band actually played over the actual recording it's my band playing and we me and my father trade back and forth vocals and we trade back and forth playing the trumpet and uh it you know it it became a lot of tearjerker moments for the band and i as we're playing along and you know as uh, you know as you you know sitting back on the drums and he's playing and realizing I'm, oh my god i'm suddenly i'm playing with the louis prima uh it became neat and and kind of a uh interesting little tune and a fun tune it, it's it's I, I think you can hear the similarities. <laughs> you can definitely tell we're related in voice and in trumpet playing style and things. Uh, and we we enjoyed it so much that I believe on this album that we're sitting on right now, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but we're going to do it again with another song, uh, a little different. But uh, I, I think it's it, I think it's neat and it gives the fans some uh, an oh my gosh moment as well. Awesome. I cannot wait to hear that. So we got to start winding down a conversation. So yep. who are your, who are the singers, the songwriters, producers, musicians that are on the dream collaborations and how would they impact the witnesses sound? I, I would love to sit in a room. I mean, you, you know, you can't do it now, but I would love to sit in a room and write with Malcolm and Angus Young from ACDC. I mean, that was my favorite band as a kid. And I really enjoy the way they write and, and the, the, the blues aspects of their music. I think it's, um, I think it's brilliant how they work off of each other. And it's, uh, <laughs> my, my youngest son will always complain. Everything sounds alike. And I'm like, well, that's the beauty of it. It's accessible. You know, it's, uh, it's accessible, but difficult. Um, so to, to sit in with them and write, I think would be neat and to sit in, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's, it, I think I've been spoiled by, with Jim Irvin from Warrior Records. Uh, he, you know, we produce the albums, but him in the studio as a producer, it's amazing to watch him work, uh, and deal with. 10 instruments all trying to vie for space. Um, so I think any, any, any kind of dream collaboration has kind of gone out the window as far as production goes. Uh, and I would like, you know, I would love to sit down with my father and write a song. You know, I wish that could have happened one day. I mean, he wrote sing, sing, sing. It's the, the biggest song in the world. And, uh, you know, what, I would love to hear how his mind worked and see if it's similar to mine when we're writing. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to sit down with Michael Jackson one day and see his creative process because he, you know, when you watch that video of him rehearsing for the last tour when he passed away, the attention to detail and how, I mean, he knew he knew everything he wanted to go on. So I, I would have loved to have sat in a room with him and heard that collaboration. And, uh, you know, Willie Nelson. That, oh, Can you, absolutely. I mean, look, we, when we write the four of us that write the songs for us are four completely different people. We have, you know, hundreds of years of of experience and tastes and and likes and dislikes that we bring to the table and i think that's what gives us a unique sound um you know so i you know collaboration i, I would love to collaborate with people that aren't this style i would love for snoop dog to walk in one day and go that's a, what what could you do with this you know and and you sit and you work something out and I, you know, I enjoy the creative process. So, you know, give me anybody that's, uh, 
musical, you know, you, you can go through the Aerosmiths, you can go through, you know, put Keith Richards in a, in a room with me. Let me, let me see what that sounds like. You know, it's, it's, it's part of the creative process. And I think that, I think as a band, no matter what we do or who we collaborate with, we're going to sound like us. And that person that comes in like Jim Urban or the engineer, David Dominguez, that works on our music, you know, they, they add their touch to it to make it better. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> that, those are all incredible collaborations. I love, I love the Michael Jackson one with this is it. I love that film. And I was like, man, those concerts would have been epic. Oh my God. I watched that so many times over and over again. I just, I enjoy watching him work. He, uh, you know, that, that man, you know, to his, to his ultimate detriment, uh, was a workaholic when it came to the music and the production and the dancing and, and the show. And he's, uh, that, that was a true genius, you know, Prince. That's yes. another one. Wow. I oh, would yeah. love to work with him. That would have been an amazing one to see you and Prince yeah. work together. <laughs> I actually, uh, we, one of my early, early dates in Las Vegas, uh, he had the room at the uh, Rio Hotel um, for quite some time, had the whole downstairs colored purple and had a DJ booth. Um, and I got to sit in and watch him rehearse his show several times. And he's a, that's, that's an interesting cat that that guy watching him work was magical uh and i got to be in the room for it so that was uh that that'll that'll remain near and dear to my heart watching watching him work because uh, you know there's um for as much fun as we're having on stage and as much fun as we have in life as entertainers not just me and my band it's the, the people that are out there and can be successful at this, the amount of work and dedication that goes into it. I don't know if, you know, the, the, I, I don't know if everybody realizes the, the 100% dedication and work you have to put in on your craft, honing it and being able to deliver it at the drop of a hat, uh, no matter what the circumstances it's, uh, you know that's a, we 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 are a special breed and uh, the people i perform with are a special breed that are able to get up there and do that and uh I, it's what drives us it what it's what makes us a little weird <laughs> but it's mm-hmm. uh it's 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 i i can't see myself doing anything else and i know the rest of the band feels the same way and i'm sure most artists you're going to come across will say the exact same thing Awesome. So our, the last question, are you ready for it? Yep. Where can my audience find your music and find and connect with you? It is lewisprimajr.com. That's L-O-U-I-S-P-R-I-M-A-J-R.com. It's a simple website. You can see videos there. There's links to all the music, our 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 two CDs that we have out and our Christmas single that we put out this year um, are available anywhere you get music, iTunes, Amazon, record stores. Uh, you can go to the website and buy directly uh, from the record label as well. Uh, you'll find tour dates on there. There's a little button that says track, hit that track button, fill out the information. And when we're coming to your town, you'll get a little email that tells you so, so you don't miss out on the live show. Um, cause it truly is a live show and we've got a new album that we've been sitting on for <sighs> since the beginning of the pandemic. We were in Capitol records recording album number three. I'm chomping at the bit to get this out. We stuck the Christmas tune we recorded out there. Hey, skinny Santa that's out there for you to download right now. Uh, it will be a bonus track on the album as well. And we hope to be getting this album out within the next month or two, maybe three months as soon as the world gets back to normal and I'm excited to be bringing new music, but Lewis links to everything, all the social media, all the videos, everything's right there. And if you haven't seen a live show, come see a live show. I guarantee you a good time. All righty. So guys, all right. All righty guys. If you missed an episode of the Jake's take with Jacob on your podcast, Visit our Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addicts, Spotify, and Spreaker. 
It is Jake's Take with Jacob Elishar, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Are you on social media? Because I'm on social media too. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, Jacob Elishar, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. And Louis, just to let you know, the jakes-shake.com is the place that you find articles, interviews, and reviews. This is, it's, it's getting ready to celebrate its 11th anniversary in august wow right on happy anniversary <laughs> thank you so much lily and guys please consider heading to paypal to keep jakes and my platform up and running i am the one editing and auditing editing autoing and actually sending out requests so please if, you, if you're financially able to please consider if not a great social media life and follow be great louis it was a privilege to talk with you i truly enjoyed yeah. our time a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me. Thanks a hundred million times. All right. Louis. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much for watching, for watching us on YouTube. Have a great one. Bye. Bye.